Neil, uh, you want to talk about our world or another one? So, this one. Okay. So uh, actually, a parallel universe to this one called Ames, Iowa, which is the town where I grew up. Um, <laughs> it's um, it's the home of uh, Iowa State University, which is a school that, in a lot of ways, is is similar to uh, to this one. Um, the the main difference being that unlike uh, ASU. ISU is not embedded in a, a great big city, so it's a, a kind of a self-contained academic community out on the <clears throat> out on the high prairie. And um, Ames, uh, yeah, different universities develop different sort of areas of specialization depending on who's working there and what they're good at. And one thing that uh, Iowa State got pretty good at in the middle of the 20th century was metallurgy. And so um, when metallurgy became a really important topic uh, during the, uh, the Manhattan Project, um, some of the people in Ames were, were called upon to make use of their, uh, of their skills uh, in refining uranium. So I'm not talking about enriching uranium, which is a, a, a more difficult process uh, and, and requires bigger equipment. I'm talking about the simple process of of taking the, the ore um, that is mined out of the ground and, and producing a fairly pure uh, sample of, of uranium from that. Uh, they needed it because a few hundred miles off to the east in Chicago, uh, a, in a racquetball court, uh, a, the, the, the world's first atomic pile was being constructed. Um, and um, the, the way this thing was built uh, is basically a big cubicle stack consisting largely of, of blocks of, of really pure graphite. And, and um, among the graphite was uranium in a sort of roughly spherical configuration. And based on the uh, calculations that they had done with the samples of uranium that they had, they had a pretty good idea of how big that sphere was going to have to be in order for them to get the, the critical reaction that they were looking for. Um, so, um, so they built this thing up one layer at a time uh, using the uranium that they could get. And at some point, uh, a new kind of uranium started coming in from my hometown, which is called Spedding's Eggs. So Spedding, Frank Spedding, was a, a metallurgist who, uh, who worked there. And, uh, he and some of the people he worked with had come up with a new way of re refining uranium, which is based on the thermite reaction. So I don't know if you know about thermite. It's a very popular chemistry experiment among young and old pyromaniacs, but you basically, <laughs> you take basically rust. <laughs> I thought that would bring some, uh, some people out of the woodwork. Um, <laughs> You take basically rust and aluminum and mix them together, and once you get it lit, which is difficult to do, but once it gets going, it's incredibly exothermic and it's 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 spectacular, and you ended up you end up with molten metal uh, all over the place. Um, so anyway, it's a good way of getting oxygen stripped off of one metal and moving it over to another one, and um, that was what they needed to do in the case of refining this uranium. Um, of course just making a big pile of, of, of powder out in the middle of the prairie and setting fire to it wasn't exactly the right way to go about it. And so they built these sort of crucibles, uh, these really thick-walled crucibles in which they would mix the ingredients, and then they would weld it shut and set fire to the thing, and the reaction would take place inside. And much, much later, it would cool off to the point where they could go and open up the canister, and um, inside would be this beautiful little oval sort of uh, this hardened puddle of, of uranium, hence the term Spedding's eggs. Um, not quite like cuckoo eggs, but <laughs> much more powerful in a certain way. Um, so, the, uh, so these were then put on trucks and transported to Chicago and, and incorporated into the, uh, the atomic pile. And, um, the, these eggs were so much purer than the uranium that they had been working with up to that point that they actually had to change the design of the pile at that point. So if you look at a cross-section of that pile, um, 
uh, as it was finally built, the bottom part of it is a, a perfect geometric sphere, but the top part is a kind of flattened uh, oblate sphere because they realized that they didn't have to have as much uranium because they were getting better stuff from, from my hometown. So that was the, uh, the, the kind of place that I grew up. Uh, uh, there were kids in my Boy Scout troop whose, whose uh, dads had been present uh, in that racquetball court when the, um, when the reactor uh, went, went critical. Um, there were, uh, uh, this is kind of a digression, but one of my favorite aspects of that experiment was that they were worried that it might go out of control, and so they had buckets full of uh, a solution that was known to be a, a poison for this reaction, a very potent a damper of this reaction. And um, they, so standing on top of the pile, they had graduate students <laughs> holding buckets of, of this, this stuff, and uh, their job was to, to dump the, this stuff into the pile if the needle went beyond a certain level, which you would do very, very quickly if it happened. Um, but on no account were they to spill even a drop of it into the pile beforehand because it would completely destroy the utility of the pile and they would have to, to rebuild it. So anyway, um, for the rest of the, the Manhattan Project and after the war, Ames was still a place where a lot of that kind of research went on. And um, I can remember going into, I think it was Spedding Hall at, uh, at the university and seeing under glass a wine bottle covered with the signatures of uh, the people who were present when the, uh, when the experiment had, had succeeded. I don't know if it was there permanently or, or on loan, but um, it was one of these cheap Italian wine bottles that's in a little basket. And uh, the, the scientists had all signed their names on the, uh, on the wicker surrounding the bottle. Um, so, um, uh, and, and, and later on when I was in college, I worked as a research assistant um, in a, a lab there. And I can remember um, uh, talking to a crusty old technician uh, who liked to give the young guys a hard time. And, and he took a, a bar of metal about the size of a pencil out of an envelope on his desk and he handed it to me. He said, what do you think that is? And I began weighing it in my hand uh, and um, guessed all of the dense metals I knew of, like osmium, um, because I was a smart little physics major and I knew who, what all the heavy metals were. And uh, when I had run down the list of all of them, he told me that I was holding a bar of uranium in my hand. Um, so I kind of froze up for a second, and he snatched it out and stuffed it into an envelope and uh, said, you probably shouldn't hold that for very long. <laughs> so the, um, with that as background, I'll, I'll quickly tell a story from my Boy Scout troop, uh, just sort of going back to, to Bill's comments about getting a passion for science when you're young. Um, Boy Scouts do all kinds of projects to learn about different things, and uh, one of the projects that we were supposed to be doing was growing plants. And um, growing plants is a thing that happens quite a bit in Iowa, and so it didn't seem like a terribly interesting project on its own. <laughs> and so some of the dads in our troop decided they were going to enliven the thing by adding a little sciency twist. And so one of them got some corn seeds that were as close to sort of genetically identical as he could make them. They probably had all come off the same cob or something. And he took them across campus and gave them to one of the metallurgists who went down into the hot room, buried deep below the, the building, and picked them up with a remote manipulator arm and put them over a thick lead glass wall and set them down next to a highly radioactive isotope for some period of time, and then plucked them back out, brought them to the safe side of the wall, and took them to our next Boy Scout meeting and handed them out to us. And our instructions were to take them home, plant them, water them, and bring our plants back in a few weeks' time. And one of us, would, the, there would be one prize given out for the tallest plant and another prize given out for the weirdest mutation. <laughs> and so we all participated in that, in that project. And my plants died because I'm that kind of guy. I am the... <laughs> 
a notorious black thumb, but, but we got both kinds of plants, uh, both sort of fully normal-looking corn plants and other plants that were not identifiable as corn by, any, <laughs> by anyone who's ever seen corn, and we had all seen it. So um, um, that's, that's what it was like growing up in, in my town, and, and it's an interesting and touching thing about that place that I didn't realize how weird that was until I had left that town and gone off to places where when I would tell stories like that, people would look at me in a very funny way. <laughs> uh, so thank you. You know, when I, when I was a kid, I worked at a folk festival, and... Um, I, I, I love music, although I'm not very musical. And uh, I remember specifically um, a few events where, where the, the best musicians uh, in the festival would uh, be asked to improvise. And it was amazing because you'd see the first one and it would just blow you away. And then you think, oh, the poor second guy. And they'd blow you away. And you could, what, you, what you watched was this incredible buzz of talent and excitement because each person was excited by the person before them. And, and you know, when, when I put this together, we had no, no plans. I just thought, we'll wait and see what happens. And it, I hope that you felt the same buzz that I felt on this stage. Uh, it was just uh, amazing. Now, what we're going to do, I've decided that there's no need for us to discuss anymore between ourselves, from what I've heard. So we will take a break, and we're going to go directly to the questions from the audience, because I think uh, I'd like you to have a chance to interact with these people, and I'm in awe of them, and let's, let's thank them once again.